Chapter Two: Fish, Bicycles, and the State. I'm an anarchist because I believe the state is neither necessary nor inevitable. We don't need the state to prevent violence and preserve order. The state is not capable of managing the economy, and despite status pressure, alternatives to the state have flourished, which makes it hard to see the state as unavoidable. The state as peacekeeper, even if it's not legitimate, some statists will say the state is useful, even though it's illegitimate. We really ought to support the maintenance of state authority because we need it. We need it, according to the argument, because the threat of state violence is necessary to protect us from each other's violence. If people know that the state will intervene into private conflicts in order to keep the peace, we'll be less likely to be robbed, assaulted, and murdered. For a proponent of this kind of argument, the issue of legitimacy is irrelevant. It doesn't matter whether we have consented to the state's authority or not. If we haven't, so what? Prudential regard for ourselves and benevolent concern for others dictates that we maintain the state's power. Otherwise, we'll find ourselves immersed in constant, often violent conflict. It's important to see what this argument doesn't establish. It doesn't provide any direct reason to pay attention to just any command issued by the state. It only provides an argument for supporting the continued operation of the state as a mechanism for preventing violence against people or their possessions. If the state chooses to criminalize some sexual practice that the majority happens not to like, for instance, it is using its authority to repress dissent and enforce conformity, not per se to inhibit violent conflict. Unless it can be shown that just any societal disagreement runs a serious risk of turning into a violent dispute and therefore requires preemptive action by the state, this argument suggests that the only kind of state that deserves support is the state that protects people against actual violence—a minimal state indeed, and quite unlike any state I can think of in today's world or at any point in world history. How badly do we need the state? But why should we assume, in any case, that we need the state, an organization with a monopoly over the use of force in a given territory, to protect us against violence? After all, people can protect themselves against violence. Neighbors can watch each other's homes and workplaces. They can work together to repel the violent. And even without the state. Some people's work could be the provision of protection against violence. Someone's job could be to defend others from violent attacks, and perhaps to perform related tasks like recovering lost goods and obtaining remedies from aggressors. There is nothing logically contradictory or practically impossible about the delivery of these kinds of services by volunteers or workers without the state's involvement. Why should the need for protective services imply the need for the state? One common response is that without the state, volunteer or professional peacekeepers could end up at each other's throats. Thus, statists say. An overarching structure is essential to prevent violent encounters between armed factions. On its face, this claim doesn't seem entirely plausible. After all, there's no world state overseeing the behavior of individual countries, but most aren't at war most of the time. In view of the cost of violence, and because people are more likely than not to adhere to norms mandating peacefulness. An overarching authority with a monopoly of violence doesn't seem obviously necessary to keep aggressive acts from happening. Individual groups of neighbors and workers will have similar reasons to avoid engaging in violence. And, on a small scale, at the neighborhood or city level, the costs of aggression will be even greater. It will be easier for communities to maintain anti-aggressive norms, and for neighbors who disapprove of others' aggressive behavior to sanction them for their unreasonable actions. And of course, the costs and coordination problems involved when a neighborhood seeks to defend itself 
against thugs from another neighborhood will be much more manageable than those involved when a state with tax extracted funds at its disposal goes to a war with another state. A state, by definition, exercises monopoly power, and monopolists are notoriously inefficient. When a firm can legally prevent anyone else from engaging in the same work it performs, it will charge exorbitantly high prices and provide poor service. Our experience with other monopolists certainly doesn't give us any reason to think that the state, a monopoly, will likely provide high quality security, justice, and other services at low costs. And of course, the state. Is under even less pressure to provide high quality, low cost services than an ordinary monopolist. An ordinary monopolist can exclude others from providing the goods and services it offers, but people are generally free to avoid purchasing these goods and services at all. By contrast, the monopoly that is the state can and does force people to buy what it sells on terms it gets to set itself. Even more troubling is the fact that the state is an extremely dangerous entity. It's frequently violent on a grand scale. While states do indeed control the misbehavior of smaller gangs of thugs, they frequently oppress their own people and attack and despoil the people of other states. There is no ultimately meaningful way to aggregate and compare disparate acts of violence, but it seems clear. That the same general reasons we might have to fear violent acts committed by other people are reasons to fear the misbehavior of the state. The direct and indirect costs of violence are considerable, and I don't want to underestimate them. Those costs are certainly among the important reasons a stateless society needn't be racked by violence between armed factions. But there's no reason to think that most people in most societies today are peaceful and cooperative, primarily because they fear that the state will retaliate with violence if they misbehave aggressively. Most people, I suspect, respect social norms calling for peaceful, voluntary interactions with others for other reasons. They can see the reasonableness of these norms on both moral and practical grounds. We need each other, after all, and peacefulness and cooperation are generally more pleasant than violence. And these norms have been instilled in them by teaching and modeling, both deliberate and unconscious. And the same kind of teaching and modeling could reasonably be expected to play the role they do today in a stateless society. Internal peace, external war. I can imagine that a statist might argue, in response to what I've said, that there is considerably less violence within a given country than between countries. I'm not sure I agree that this is the case, but I'll accept it for the sake of argument. Because within a country, there's an agreed upon system of law and dispute resolution. The statist might say something like this It doesn't matter whether there is a single police agency within a state. Often, in fact, There are many such agencies, often independently managed and funded. What matters instead is that there is widespread agreement regarding the legal principles such agencies ought to follow and the courts whose decisions they ought to implement. It is this agreement, the status might argue, that ensures that diverse law enforcement agencies can cooperate to keep the peace within a state. Notice that. At this point, the statist has made an enormous concession to the anarchist. The statist has acknowledged that a single absolutely powerful agency isn't needed to keep the peace. Consider the United States. There is no plausible basis for maintaining that all national, state, and local law enforcement agencies form a single cooperative venture, a giant coordinated organization. These agencies certainly influence each other. There are clearly people who would like to centralize control of law enforcement agencies, and we have every reason to fear the kind of power that could be exercised over ordinary people if they were centralized. But right now, they're pretty obviously independent, and the status doesn't seem 
inclined to dispute this. She's acknowledging that lots of different law enforcement agencies can coexist peaceably. However, she maintains, their peaceful coexistence depends on their mutual acknowledgement of the authority of the legal system. The status shouldn't make too much of this fact, however. After all, there are lots of different legal systems. Police officers in Louisiana don't enforce and obey the same state laws and local ordinances as do their counterparts in Massachusetts. Nor do they answer to the same courts. Considerable legal variety is clearly compatible with social peace. And it's clear that people can resolve disputes peacefully despite conflicts across legal systems. Courts can apply conflict of law rules to ensure that a reasonable process is followed and a reasonable outcome is reached when someone from Wyoming sues someone from Missouri over a dispute which concerns an event in California, but which is, by agreement, subject to Delaware law. Indeed, conflict of law rules make possible the orderly resolution of disputes involving the subjects and legal systems of different states. The status might agree that there can be orderly disputes between people identified with communities whose legal systems differ. But she might opt for a fallback position. In today's worlds, state and local governments alike claim absolute authority over people who live in their respective territories. People can trust that those supposedly subject to other legal systems will keep their agreements because their governments will make them do so. But no one compels governmental actors to hold people to their agreements. They cooperate with each other, I suspect, as a result of a combination of factors, norms dictating fairness and cooperation, the desire for reputations that will lead to continued trust and cooperation, and the costs of the conflicts that might ensue if they encouraged people to ignore their obligations. The same kind of factors would encourage people in a stateless society to cooperate with each other. They would also dispose people making decisions influencing the institutions of the various communities in such a society to favor cooperation over disregard for obligations. The domestic example this statist wants to invoke here really seems to depend principally on a consensus about choice of law rules, since it doesn't obviously depend on the existence of a single body of relevant legislation or a single law enforcement agency. And choice of law rules can obviously be used to resolve disputes in a stateless society just as they can be within a modern state with multiple legal systems. Perhaps the status will want to say that, while there are multiple kinds of law enforcement agencies and legal systems in the United States, for instance, national police and military agencies are always available to resolve conflicts between them. On this view, the ability of multiple legal systems to coexist rests on the background availability of state violence as a means of regulating disputes. Without the threat of force by national agencies, conflicts between local law enforcement agencies would be as frequent as conflicts between national armies. I'm not sure the state's claimed monopoly of violence is really the only relevant factor here, though. First, in some states, violence is common. Life for many people in many states is violent and, well, pretty awful. States don't always keep violence under control, and states often engage in sustained violence against people living within their boundaries. So it's not clear that a comparison between interstate and interstate violence always works out to the advantage of the state. Second, the level of violence within a given state that doesn't result from the state's own misdeeds isn't just a function of the degree to which the state threatens to use force against the violent. Poverty, economic ties, cultural norms, and cultural homogeneity, or the existence or non-existence of cultural norms promoting successful responses to cultural heterogeneity, all matter too. 
it isn't even surprising that the level of violence within most Western societies is relatively low. But the low level of violence is likely to be a function of the fact that these societies are economically comfortable, that people are economically interdependent, and that values supportive of cooperation and social peace are widely shared. These factors all seem likely to be present in these societies, whether there are states or not. So the relative stability of these societies doesn't provide particularly strong evidence of the value of state authority. Norms favoring cooperation and fairness and opposing aggressive force would likely tend to keep things relatively quiet even without the threat of state violence. In addition, the costs of attacking others would be considerable, and without the state, they would be borne depending on how a given community organized safety services, by volunteers, members of mutual defense cooperatives, charities, or full-time safety and defense workers, and the people compensating those workers. None of these people is likely to be too enthusiastic about shouldering the financial burdens associated with violent conflict, costs including lost time, lost resources, a sullied reputation, physical injury, and death. And that means there will be considerable pressure to avoid this kind of conflict, to make agreements with others likely to reduce it, and to avoid people likely to provoke it. I've talked here about communities, and for simplicity's sake, I've treated a community as geographically localized, but it certainly doesn't need to be. People can belong to multiple overlapping communities, and different communities, different social networks and organizations, religious congregations, clubs, groups of people involved in the same kind of work, can perfectly well maintain different legal systems. Different kinds of groups can develop bodies of law appropriate for different kinds of circumstances and different kinds of disputes. And where the concerns of different groups overlap, the same kinds of conflict of law rules that govern disputes between people from territorially distinct communities can apply.